Hello, everybody. I am Matt Carruthers with Cox Communications. This is Matt House with Cox Communications. Fun trivia, everyone who works at Cox is named Matt. This is our generic conference presentation. Uh, we will start off with Matt House, who is the system administrator who runs all of our Archimy infrastructure. I still have to stop myself from saying Moloch. Runs all of our packet brokers, and he's going to talk some about our infrastructure and the challenges we face there. Hey, how's it going, folks? Uh, Matt House, a uh, big story about our infrastructure is that we have a lot of it uh, and uh, a lot going on with it. Um, right now, we're at a 6.3 petabyte with uh, 67 sensors out in the world, uh, 33 elastic servers, uh, four different uh, groups, some clustered, some standalone, uh, trying to dial that back and centralize a few things, uh, and 29 packet brokers, uh, uh, all uh, Ixia gear, um, Vision 1, E40s, and E100s uh, that are out there right now. Um, this year, we're expanding some of that. We've got some gear that's finally aging off down to as small as like 20 terabytes of server, uh, and we are, the new ones uh, that we're deploying are about 800 terabytes per server with the arrays that are attached. So getting rid of a lot of stuff and replacing it with a few things. So adding 3.4 petabyte more, we're gonna be right about the 10 petabyte of PCAP uh, state once that's complete here. Uh, hopefully within a couple of months, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and adding more elastic uh, uh, as, as things go as well. Um, also uh, our, our uh, as a, Security Oregon Cox has gotten a lot better with uh, requirements and compliance requirements for everyone, but we had to go out of our own little skunk works uh, realm and align with our own organization, which was a lot of work <laughs> and uh, slowed some things down. So rebuilding our lab, uh, upgrade finally to version, hopefully happening here, uh, version four uh, later this year. Uh, and then the other big thing is we're, we're, we're erring on the side of uh, write more and don't miss anything. Uh, so we have a lot of storage that we're storing a lot of data we don't really need. Uh, and we found that filtering is really hard, um, trying to determine what to keep and what not to. One of the most difficult things to figure out and which stakeholders need to be involved and who's going to make those calls. Um, and uh, to free up time to do a lot of that, uh, we made a lot of progress on automation and documenting things because a lot of tribal knowledge, a lot of us I am and him way too often uh, for the first uh, first year, but it's gotten a lot better. Uh, less as time goes on. Yeah. And the uh, filtering side of things is, uh, like I say, that, that that's like a big, there's so much ground to gain there uh, with, you can either keep throwing money at infrastructure or figure out a better game plan uh, to do that. So we certainly welcome if anybody's got best practices or what processes they've gone through to come up with that. We would love to leverage it uh, and see what you guys have done on the filtering front. Um, you know, it, it, there's really just the three buckets and security relevant, you know, things like auth logs and stuff, really, really simple. You know, you're going to need that stuff, potentially security relevant, really easy too, because you can just call anything that uh, and write it uh, and not security relevant, the hard one. Uh, other thing that we've uh, run into is uh, operations leaders really like this data when they find out what we have and are able to get them out of a pinch or prove who did what. And the bad side of that is that they really like this data and they're expecting, oh, well, then show me that once. Can, I need that in 20 minutes before this next presentation about what went wrong with my application. So trying to figure out how that engagement's going to work. And uh, we've been opening up the tool with, uh, you know, with a, a, a force expression headers so people can view the traffic to their own gear and trying to figure out, you know, we need to get on four so we can use that role management. It's going to make that a lot easier to have that by teams instead of our list of tons and tons of users at the moment. So, but that's me. Uh, I try to keep his stuff up. I'm on the team that does like the log ingestion, uh, SIM, EDR, uh, log stash, Kafka, uh, upstream from the SIM, uh, and uh, keeping this tool online at Cox. The other Matt. Thank you, other Matt. We have a, a couple of layers of filtering I thought I'd mention. Uh, the first line of defense is, of course, the packet brokers themselves. The Ixia E40s and E100s have a nice API that you can use. So we can do things like, let's find the ASN that Microsoft uses for Microsoft Office, pull down all the IP blocks associated with that, and jam it into a filter because we don't need to log that. We also do some searching around in Kibana for top talkers to find things like, 
oh, the backups that we're backing up. And uh, we also do some of uh, the filtering rules on the MOLOC sensors themselves for when we need a little more granularity. Like when we find a sensor that's making the same DNS lookup uh, a thousand times a second or something, we want to block that one particular host name uh, rather than all DNS traffic. So here's where the presentation starts to go off the rails. Uh, if you've seen Game of Thrones, this will make a lot of sense to you. Uh, the following slides were made uh, about 20 minutes before I gave another presentation. And some of them were made just this morning as Andy and Elise kept reminding me about things that would make sense to talk about. First of all, user management. We have a product called SailPoint. Every employee has a role within our company, and SailPoint manages the permissions and things that every employee needs to do their job. So we have a task in SailPoint for Moloch. So when someone comes onto the security team, they automatically get provisioned into Moloch using the Moloch API. We use uh, Apache and Azure AD for our authentication. So it all goes through O365. It's got MFA. It's super cool. Don't make that face at me, Andy. Couple notes on Wise. We run Redis on each of our sensors. We use a product called Dynamite to distribute data to all of these Redises at once. And we put all the stuff that we want in there. So for example, our asset database goes into there. If we have sources of user awareness that says, says which user is using a particular IP, we shove it in there. So all our sessions get tagged with interesting data that way. It's a good way to distribute your threat data out to a bunch of sensors without having to centralize it. Now let's talk about logs. So this is how our logs used to look many years ago. We had a bunch of log sources. They were pointed at a SIM. Uh, it sucked. It was useless for any forensic investigation because it took hours to search and uh, our retention was terrible. So we decided that we were going to buy a new SIM and we decided to fix this architecture so that if we had to get rid of it again, we wouldn't have to go through all this pain. So now our architecture looks like this. All of our uh, log sources are pointed at a log broker, which can then multiplex the data out to as many things need it as possible. Diving down into the log broker itself, this is what we call a log stash sandwich. All of our sources are pointed at log stash, which feeds into Kafka. And then another log stash pulls that data back out. The initial log stash layer does a bit of uh, filtering. It does some enrichment. Uh, the second log stash then does normalization, or uh, in the case of the SIM, just passes the logs on in their native format because the SIM understands those log formats. I will also talk a bit about the observed indicator list that is pulling from Kafka in a minute here. So here's something uh, super cool we're doing with this multiplexing. Uh, when the data comes out of that second log stash, it goes directly into Elasticsearch in its raw form. We're also working on converting all of our log sources into Elastic Common Schema so that, for example, your source IP is always source.ip regardless of what log source you're talking about. And the really cool thing we're doing is what we're calling distillation of logs into security events. So as an ISP, we've had a lot of issues with customers coming under attack, and we discovered in some of those early instances that it was very difficult to build a timeline to figure out what had actually happened to any given customer. As a specific example, we were looking at a bunch of raw Apache logs and trying to figure out if a customer's password had been reset. So we discovered that if a... Uh, an attacker went to like forgot password.html and then when there was an HTTP post followed by something else, followed by something else, that was a password reset. And storing all those raw logs is terrible because it takes up a lot of space and it takes a long time to build out any kind of dashboard around this. So what we're doing with this distillation is we're taking these raw logs and we're distilling them into events. So instead of storing three different lines of Apache logs, we just store one event that says password was reset from IPX for customer Z, and uh, the events are much smaller that way. We get much better retention, we normalize all the field names, and we can build this easy dashboard or a timeline of events that shows exactly what happened to any given customer. And of course, we can build detections around that. 
So this idea was so cool that we decided to do it for all of our enterprise logs as well, and uh, that's in progress. So for example, we're taking our Azure logs and whatever blob of mess comes from Azure that says that a user logged in and just generating one distilled event that says login from this IP, from this machine, for this username, et cetera. So very excited about that. Moving on to the official topic of this, which was OIL, the observed indicator list. Uh, this is actually a recycled slide from three or four years ago at Molacon. If you're not familiar with Redis, it's a key value store. You set a key to a value. Later, you use that key to retrieve that value. Uh, big O1, uh, it doesn't do anything else except store keys and then retrieve them. So how we use that for security, how we started using that for security is what we call the observed indicator list or OIL. So every time we see a net flow, we shove it into the Redis database. Source IP is one key, destination IP is the other key. So anytime we want to know, have we seen a given IP in our environment, we just check the OIL. You issue a get on that Redis. If nothing pops up, you know you've never seen that IP before. If something does pop up, you know the most recent time you saw it. Not every time you saw it, but just the most recent one. It allows us to do super quick triage on all of these lists of bad IPs that we get from threat fees. So now we have moved on to what we're calling mega oil, which is putting everything we possibly can into Redis. So the key is any indicator we want to find. It's IPs, it's usernames, it's host names, it's URLs, it's anything that you could ever possibly want to search for in a security log. We have a very simple web interface, which uh, as you've seen from my PowerPoint skills, uh, you wouldn't be surprised that this web page is just a giant empty box with a button that says search, and it checks everything that you paste into there against oil. So now when we get a CSV with a thousand IPs in it from CISA or something, we can just copy and paste it in there. It refangs all the indicators and gives us a very quick yes or no as to whether we have seen something. Here are some of the log sources that we've got. We've got our NetFlow, we've got, uh, uh, we're working on EDR events from our endpoints, Azure, Firewall, Zscaler. Our asset database is in there, which is super helpful when you're doing any kind of uh, triage on a security incident. Okta for our customer security logs, and a thing that we call Coxsight. Is anybody from Comcast here? Okay, in that case, uh, there's nobody from Comcast here, so I invented this with no help from anyone else. <laughs> it was definitely not an idea called Xsite from Comcast that I put a CO in front of and stole. Uh, the idea is to passively create an asset database by monitoring your security logs. If you've ever worked incidents, you know that the biggest problem you run into is you've got an IP, it's doing something bad, and you have no idea what it is. You don't know what kind of server it is, you don't know who owns it. So uh, we're monitoring our security logs to pull out the device type, host name to IP mappings, because why would anyone put proper reverse DNS on all their IPs uh, and device owners? We do that by monitoring our authentication logs and also our traffic logs. So for example, uh, Zscaler gives us the username, the source IP, and the destination IP. So anytime we see a connection on port 22 or 3389, we can assume that it's a login. Now we have a username of someone who at least tried to log into something, and we have an idea of who may have uh, owned that. Next up is a tool we call Count Sokula. I have worked at Cox Communications for a little over 22 years now. And the crowning achievement of my entire career is that logo that you're looking at. Uh, Count Sokula is an API gateway to query all of our tools and return the data back in Elastic Common Schema. So now we can query passive DNS, we can query uh, CBR, carbon black response, our endpoint agent, GOIP, VPN checks, LDAP lookups, whatever else. Anything that our SOC needs to do on a regular basis has now a nice consistent interface with data that's returned in a consistent format. And uh, that is it. We have run off the end of the horse. Questions, comments, concerns?
So the question is, how do we translate all of the raw logs that we get with all of their random fields into ECS? Uh, the answer is slowly and manually. Uh, we're using Logstash for that, so we're writing Logstash uh, filters to translate the field names as we see them. Elastic itself has done some of the work. Elastic has a SIM product. We're not using it, but they have done some of the work of mapping these field names, so that's been a handy reference for us. Andy. Did you actually get rid of the question is, did we get rid of the old SIM or do we have two? Uh, we got rid of the old one. If you've seen that that episode, or excuse me, if you've seen that that scene from Office Space with the printer and the bats, that's how we felt about our old sim. And then for Mega Oil, So the question is, how are we scaling Redis for Mega Oil? And honestly, we're just pumping more and more data into it, and eventually it'll fall over, and we'll need two Redises. But uh, for now, it all fits in one. Yes, we are using TTLs. One thing you can do with Redis is when you set a key, you can give it an expiration. So for an IP, I think we leave it in there for six months or something like that. Yeah. Something exciting that we are planning to do with this in order to actually tie it into Archimy a little bit is that Archimy generates NetFlow, if you're not familiar with that. So all of our sensors are not only PCAPing data, but they're shooting NetFlow into our SIM, which can then read and uh, create detections around that. And one of our next additions into Mega Oil will be that NetFlow, as well as the NetFlow that we're getting from firewalls and stuff today. Rich? Yes. Question is, are we doing east-west traffic as well as north-south? Um, that's actually a, a super interesting question. We added taps to all of our field locations so that an office in one city talking to an office in the other city crosses over our taps and through our Moloch infrastructure. It became an interesting problem that I talked about at one of the previous uh, Molocons. I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, because when a packet goes from one office to the other, it crosses two taps and two sensors, and so the traffic was being logged in two places. Both of those centers, sen sensors were writing to one Elasticsearch, but there's no way to deduplicate it on the back end at the Elasticsearch level, as far as I know. Feature request. Uh, and because we had 18 different field locations, this was actually a star problem and not just two things connected together. So it was actually a little, it was a little interesting to figure out an algorithm to say that when I've got traffic going from site A to site B, I only want to see it in one direction. And then A to C, I only want that, but then B to C, I need to get that one, but not the B to A. Uh, it makes more sense to see it in a diagram. So the question is, how did we actually do that blocking? And we use the filters on the packet brokers. I got the IP space associated with each of those field offices and then wrote an algorithm to build the series of filters and the Ixia API to push them out. Chris, you had a question? No, Adam. Archimy doesn't do that. So yes, it would be fantastic if each Archimy sensor generated a deterministic session ID so that two sensors seeing the same flow would generate the same session ID and they would just overwrite each other on the Elasticsearch side. But it doesn't work that way today. Because for logs, the deduplication method I use is if you then overwrite the uh, ID The problem with community ID and a lot of these solutions is there's no time part built in. 
And then you start talking about, do all your sensors have to be in sync? And then you have everything always goes to NTP, right? NTP or whatever you're using is going to be the downfall of society. So I don't <laughs> know a quick way to fix it. It'd be very interesting. We should talk about it more. Mm -hmm. But that's in general why we have problems with these is because community, community ID and other things don't have the time aspect. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is from my presentation, I want to say, four years ago when I was initially talking about this. So this is our Office A and Office B situation. So we wanted to capture the WAN traffic between the two, but we ended up with duplicate sessions because a packet going from Office A to Office B goes through both of these ICSIAs, both of these sensors, and then both sessions get uh, sent to Elasticsearch. And I've just realized I'm pointing at stuff with my mouse and you can't see my mouse pointer. There we go, laser pointer. All right, so packets from A to B go through both of these Ixias, both of these Molochs, and get sent to the same Elasticsearch. Uh, so the problem is that it's a full mesh because every site can talk to every other site. So when we send traffic now, I'm going to have to remember four years ago uh, and see if I can explain these slides correctly. I think the red line is a filter blocking traffic from one to two. So in this diagram, traffic between one and two is blocked, but traffic from two back to one is not blocked. Then you have to add another filter blocking two to three and one to three, and et cetera. So the fourth site needs three blocks. The fifth site needs four blocks, et cetera, until you get to the last site, uh, which doesn't need any of the traffic at all because it's covered by the other sensors. So if you're interested in that, I can dig up the code and uh, save you some time writing an algorithm for that. Sandy. So for this example, is the majority of your traffic full mesh and that's why you had to do this? Like, so. In the past, I've worked with offices where we've talked about this, but it's it's like such a low percentage, it just wasn't worth it. Uh, I wouldn't say the majority of our traffic, definitely not the majority of the traffic because we're monitoring some other internal data centers that have a lot more traffic. Uh, but at the time, this was a big deal. Okay. No, it's, uh, there's no asynchronous routing, so there should be no issues with half the flow going past one sensor and another half going past the other. All right, anybody else? Are you going to open source it? Sure. When? This specific yeah. algorithm for generating no, these, no, no. this set of filters? Mega oil or any of these pieces. One by the X yeah. size. Yeah. Uh, I have not, I haven't considered open sourcing it, but you know, I'm happy to. It's basically just a, a bunch of log stash configs that pull from our Kafka queue. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, happy to share any of that. Cool. In fact, if we could get a community of people writing log stash filters to translate stuff into ECS. <laughs> ah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> Lots of back scratch. I'm sorry, open source. So Paul's comment was scaling Redis. They uh, used Couchbase. Went to Couchbase. I'm not familiar with that, but I'll look it up. It has its own set of bundles. Fantastic. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thanks. I've been Matt. He's been Matt. We've enjoyed our time. <laughs>